Ron, in the fall, we were discussing energy policies, and um, Vice President Duncan was unable to be here. He's still traveling uh, due to the crisis in the Ukraine, and you were worried about the future of eminent domain. Yes. Our legislators can certainly comment on the latest information. Catch us up on what you were worried about and the implementation of the, the future of that. Sure. And if I'm trying to remember my, my comments from a few months ago, but I think I was worried about if there was a, a, a pipeline or a, an electric grid power s system that came in and they could take use eminent domain to take property from uh, to, for their pathway for the pipeline or the, the power grid lines. And so that was concerning to me that they could just do that without, without having the landowners supporting what project that was going through their property. Um, eminent domain is good for, for public benefit, but I'm not sure it's good for private enterprises benefit. Enter Representative Hammond and Representative Swanson. I totally agree with you, Ron. We saw in the last energy bill where there was, it did allow for eminent domain for a private company to go across Southern Illinois. And that's, um, of course, Noreen and I did not support that legislation, but because of the eminent domain, and, and Farm Bureau's been a big, loud voice on that. Um, we see the two CO2 lines coming through Illinois now too, and it's got a lot of farmers concerned about eminent domain once again. And, and uh, you know, we had turbines put on some farm ground that we rent, and uh, it, it, it causes um, a lot of compaction issues, and uh, you know they don't understand what the ramifications of this big equipment across our ground, and then losing control of, of our own private ground. So yeah, it's it's a big concern, and we're seeing too much of it being entered in legislation now. And the biggest concern, and and Ron, you and and the listeners know this, um, our biggest concern is setting a precedent. And with that energy bill, including a private company um, giving them um, eminent domain rights, um, that sets a precedent. And so as we move forward and we're having discussions about CO2 pipelines and whatever it may be, um, we need to keep that in mind. While the ICC still has control, um, we just don't know, given what was included in that energy bill, um, how much control and how much control the private landowner is going to continue to have in the future. So um, at a meeting I was at with the Illinois Soybean Association, the, the CO2 pipeline folks came and made a presentation to us. Their presentation was was pretty good. They didn't talk about having eminent domain at this point in their mm -hmm. process, but I want to emphasize at this point, it can always change if state legislature wants to put a higher priority on capturing that carbon. Their proposal is is good. It's, they're going to sequester carbon. One of the questions I ask is, what happens to that? Uh, carbon emissions right now and they said it's just released into the atmosphere so the generally my my thoughts are is that's a good thing to try and capture that given with all their other national talk about carbon sequestration the devil in the details is what happens to the landowners and their property and um, you know compensation is is um, important but family history of, of centuries old farmland is important also and that needs to be considered. Right, and, and some of these are some large pipes, 24 inch pipes yeah. going through farm ground. That takes a big trench. It takes, it's got to be a deep trench and and uh, it, it, like I said, compaction's our biggest issue with what we had on our farm ground. We're still fighting the, the turbines were built seven or eight years ago yeah. and uh, I walked out in our bean field and where the equipment went across um, in about July, let early August, up to my waist, where the crane had not gone, but just barely above yeah. my knees. So you know, 18 inches difference between uh, the, the size of the beans. That loss of pods. So yeah. makes a big difference. This yeah. heavy equipment on the ground. Jake Armstrong with the Warren Henderson Farm Bureau. What, how would you suggest, or what are some other ways that we can sequester carbon without infringing upon a farm or landowner's land? 
so there's lots of talk right now and I do not have the answer to this being totally transparent here but with carbon credits uh, using cover crops having companies um, paying farmers to do the practices that Ron was talking about whether it be like I said cover crops or no-till um, or grazing cattle or, or 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 lots of options that we're already using and implementing um, they've talked about doing these carbon credits to compensate farmers um, my issue with those are they're going to reward new practices. So let's say Ron has been no-tilling for a couple decades. He's not going to get any compensation for doing the right thing, quote unquote, for all those years. And so in order for him to benefit from the program, he's going to have to till, rip his ground up three, four years, and then go back to no-till if that's what, if he wants to capture that economic gain. Now I don't think people who have no-tilled for decades are going to do that, but it's not necessarily a fair program for the people who have been doing the right things, who have been environmentally minded for decades. Um, it, it's, as Ron said, there's a lot of devil in those details to get this right because agriculture is a solution to a lot of these problems. We just have to do it in a fair and balanced way um, for compensating landowners for what they do and practices that they've been done, plus the resources that they have at their hands with just the land and the placement of everything. So. Representative Swanson. Yeah, I was just going to comment. You know, as a corn grower with two ethanol plants within 20 miles, yeah. um, one ethanol plant will be part of the, the CO2 capture, one will not. But, you know, as a farmer growing corn, am I going to reap some benefits from um, higher commodity prices, too, from the corn I deliver to that elevator? So, you know, there's kind of two sides to this coin of where the benefits may lay. Um, yeah, I, as someone who is not on any maps to get any of these lines, but has gone through the uh, turbine process, um, I have a different view on it too than what someone who has land that's going to be part of this pipeline. So, um, you know, it, like I said, there's two sides of this coin. I can be a reaper of the benefits or I could be a, a loss of those benefits too if my ground's being, um, uh, eminent domain applied on my farm ground so Ron Moore yeah so I'm gonna go back to what some of what Jake was talking about on the carbon credits the numbers I've been hearing is for twenty dollars an acre twenty dollars a ton for sequestered carbon and you have to do that every year and improve your practices when you look at the input cost for an acre of corn this year twenty dollars an acre is pretty insignificant um, so there has to be a higher rate of compensation to get a widely adopted practices done um, to, to sequester carbon in the amount that some people are wanting to get done. And as I've talked about these carbon credits over the years, you know, my argument is why, why is company A going to pay me $20 an acre and still get to pollute? And that's my biggest argument. And and so as people who are a lot smarter than me talk about it, they say, well, it's not necessarily so they can continue to pollute. It's so their stockholders can prove to the, to the company can prove to their shareholders that they're environmentally conscious and they avoid having a, a hostile annual meeting to, that they would have to, it's difficult to get anything done when you have people screaming at you all the time at an annual meeting because of their shareholders are unhappy and so it's not to me it's not about preserving the environment as much as it is about preserving the company's shareholders Jim Lighting why don't you comment on that with Big River Resources? You have your annual shareholder meeting, and comprehensive energy policies affect you and your industry very much. Uh, we're very much into uh, uh, the energy, and the new team's going to be squaring up uh, as carbon legislation will continue. Um, the ethanol plants, as discussed, uh, for those who don't know, are one of the industries that have a very clean stream of carbon dioxide coming off our CO2 scrubbers from fermentation. So as we're moving forward today, uh, looking at carbon intensity of fuels, 
ethanol currently is 40% less carbon intensive than gasoline. Uh, Harvard study came out recently to show that. And as we see Canada with uh, low carbon fuel standards uh, moving, we're seeing more areas move toward what California and Oregon, uh, what they're doing. And what it does is reward that lower carbon fuel. And so all of the industries involved in providing fuel are going to have an incentive as these programs would grow uh, to ensure that their products are as low carbon as possible. And the two-edged sword uh, that Dan indicated is, is very true. We're very concerned about uh, property rights uh, relative to eminent domain, um, but we're also concerned in ensuring that we provide a competitive marketplace for our customers' corn uh, within this area, and that will be inclusive going forward in making changes to our processes uh, to reduce our carbon footprint on every gallon of ethanol we market. Um, which flows right back to uh, the corn growers, our customers. Um, as we're going forward, there's going to be an increased emphasis really on soybeans with sustainable aviation fuel is the next one that's coming. Um, EVs uh, may be on light duty vehicles, uh, but there's a long way to go before we're going to power uh, the whole fleet. If you look at EIA data today, uh, 2050, they're only talking maybe 20% of the light duty fleet uh, potentially being on electrification. So it says that liquid fuels are going to be with us a long time and lower carbon intensity. Uh, ethanol is part of that process. Uh, we're in a good place today, uh, but regardless of whether it's farming practice, whether it's carbon sequestration, whether it's reducing our energy needs in our facilities, all of those long term are going to be a piece of the puzzle. Um, relative to uh, the carbon emphasis that we're seeing in in the world and in our in Washington DC and regardless of who's in power at any given time this isn't going to go away and so you have to embrace it to a degree and we're going to have to be part of that new culture going forward relative to carbon footprints and carbon intensity. Uh, and then working through the controversies, whether it be what the reward is for farming practice or sequestration or whatever other uh, to incent businesses and farms are businesses, they need to be uh, compensated for extra costs to achieve those goals. Uh, that's all part of the puzzle. How do we sort through those controversies, whether it's eminent domain or whether it's uh, a facility such as ours where there's, there's going to be significant investments in order to make that carbon sequestration happen and reduce our carbon footprint. Jim, you have um, multiple locations, including, let's look at the Iowa, Illinois, with Galva and Burlington. Do you receive any incentives to help with your carbon footprint? Because you already had a, a nice, um, you know, with ethanol being 40% less than gasoline. In a lot of ways, we've been ahead of the game as farmers when it comes to preserving the environment. Do, do you get any help uh, in trying to exercise ways to improve it? Currently, for those two facilities, we're not seeing an impact. We are beginning to see an impact on the Canadian program at our Boyceville plant, but we anticipate seeing programs that are going to come through. Uh, relative to carbon sequestration, uh, the Q45 tax credit is $50 a ton for sequestered carbon, and that's what's driving the pipeline systems. So they would take 
the CO2 off our fermentation scrubbers, compress it to 2,200 pounds, and then it needs to be injected into the, the proper geology, which we do see that in southern Illinois, and there's geology in the Dakotas, which is the driver of the pipelines to get it to the geology to put it away. All of that is being supported by the companies that are actually going to sequester it and and capture it uh, with that Q45 tax credit. Okay, thank you, Jim. Rob Elliott? You know, this whole carbon market thing is a little bit the Wild West. It's a lot of confusion, but there's a lot of sorting out. There's a lot of positives. Um, I, I would say last week was the Commodity Classic in New Orleans, and uh, at that meeting, it's 7,000 people there, but there's a lot of policy uh, discussions that happen there. And if I could, relative to the whole uh, energy equation, if I could throw out three or four highlights maybe that I I kind of took away from there and one of those back to uh, Dan Solar and, and with that I, I would include wind and electric vehicles and electricity in general and as you've probably heard me say before in this forum that it, it almost seems like people in high places um, think electricity's magic and it's free. Those are the two key things to consider there but I, I think that the um, uh, approach most sound thinkers would like to put it relative to a, a carbon score on electric electric would be that we account for everything that happened through the generation process which currently now whether it's electric vehicle there are no emissions out the tailpipe it's carbon zero. We all know those batteries weren't just magically appeared and much like what ethanol has undergone the scrutiny, we, we have to give credit for the ham sandwich that Ron Moore eats when he's uh, uh, driving his corn planter as an energy intensive way to figure that complete carbon score. When it comes to solar, certainly this is not indirect land use change, it's direct land use change, much like wind is. So leveling that playing field is a big deal, and that, that's one that came out loud and clear. Another soundbite that uh, from last week, and I believe it originated with the Nebraska uh, uh, Ethanol Board, was that if one-third of uh, fuel in this country that would include E10 were to move to E15, it would replace all of our Russian oil imports that are turned into gasoline. So that's pretty significant. It's a no-brainer thing we could do tomorrow. It just if we've got a cooperative government that would give us a green light, uh, the, the ethanol industry. I think Jim would uh, uh, conclude that they they could do it in a heartbeat tomorrow if we wanted that to happen. And the other, the other piece of that is ethanol currently. I, I don't have my number. I should have looked them up this morning, but it might be close to a buck below retail uh, gas prices. So affordability, availability, supply, it's all there. But we, we're just tend to neglect and we're asking the Saudis and the Ar Iran and others to uh, send us more oil, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The other part of that, and we've talked about it before, that was talked about last week a lot, uh, and, and rightly so, is the uh, Next Generation Fuels Act. So uh, this little flyer was used at, uh, at a lot, lot of commodity meetings and, and policy development sessions. And basically, there's a growing list of congressional players that are signing on to that, as well as a lot of corporate entities that are uh, part of ag. And that list will grow even greater after last week. But uh, again, real big deal. Big deal for us in ag, big deal for ethanol, big deal for corn and soybeans and our commodity markets. But it, uh, in a nutshell, it would allow higher inclusion rates of ethanol, which provide higher octane and lower carbon, cleaner burning. Uh, that would in turn allow the autos, as again, as we've talked about before, I realize this is a review for this group, to build a smaller volume 
higher compression, turbocharged engine that could utilize that higher octane. And better mileage, better emissions, everything can happen. The autos are uh, on board to go that way. They, it would take them five years to have that product on the market. They've already declared that. But this country is driving those auto folks financially to go to electric. That's their only option. They can't afford to do anything else with the CAFE standards and the EPA regs and everything else. We're driving, driving it to electric. And I think the contention is we could have that um, higher um, inclusion rate of ethanol and be carbon neutral with electric vehicles. So a real miss on on behalf, on behalf of our country. Jim mentioned it, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up and, and hit three more things here real quick. Sustainable aviation fuels can come from ethanol. There's already been a flight with United Airlines going from Chicago uh, to DC. Uh, they've proven that'll work huge market for corn and soybeans both. Renewable diesel, a lot of that being driven by California, again another huge market that can develop. Uh, and uh, so we, we've got some good things on the horizon. We just got to get our act straight here in this country if we're going to make them click. So. You have very good points, Rob. I could literally almost go down um, your email that you had sent with all of this information. What's unique, and I want to draw Ron in and come back uh, around to what Rob had to say, but same thing with the Soybean Association. We're seeing active use of biodiesel and other energy products in the Soybean Association. Yeah, that's true. Um, biodiesel has been a great way to, to uh, reduce emissions, lubricate your engines, but now we've got renewable diesel, which is 100% bio-based diesel. It's not a blend of petroleum diesel and, and biodiesel. It's it's 100 percent bio-based fuel and so the the potential market for that is enormous. Um, you, you have heard large companies that have processed soybeans into meal and oil. They're going to use the oil for the renewable diesel but they're ramping up their potential capacity to crush soybeans Okay, so if we're going to use soybean oil for fuel instead of cooking oil and the other applications, what are we going to do with all the meal? So there's people that are trying to figure out, out how do we incre increase production of livestock to handle that extra meal that we're going to be producing to get the oil to make renewable diesel fuel. Um, so those are all questions that that we're going to be asking. Hopefully. Uh, we can export some of that into the the, uh, the world market. Currently, soybeans are 60% of the soybeans we raise in the United States go into the export market, um, and so we're we're focused on trade issues at ASA too, trying to <coughs> excuse me, trying to move more of our soybeans and soybean products overseas. And one of the things we talked about last week at Commodity Classic was with the Ukraine and Russia situation going on, um, Russia looked like they felt emboldened to move into Ukraine. What if China feels emboldened to move into Taiwan? Are we going to still let 30 million metric tons of soybeans go into the China market? Probably not. So where are we going to, what country is going to, or countries are going to take up, soak up all that 30 million metric tons of soybeans? Um, I, I'm just fearful. We're in a market volatility that's unheard of right now. If something happens in the South China Sea, China puts a, a blockade around the island of Taiwan, what's going to happen to our markets? And so that's one of the things we all talked about. We don't have any answers, but we're, we're aware that it's a potential threat. Yes, and we do plan on discussing that and breaking that down in depth. With what Ron had to say, Rob, about <clears throat> excuse me, the renewable energy, a, a large oil company uh, purchased into renewable energy. Um, I cannot remember the name of the company. I think I sent that e email Chevron out to you guys. Chevron purchased Renewable Energy Group. Yes. Does that tell you that they are embracing the opportunity 
Yeah, for $3.3 billion. It's a big stake. Yeah, and that's just one of them. I, when the oil guys and the major grain companies start becoming buddies and real money gets spent, that would tell you those markets are probably for real. So We are uh, seeing the uh, new soybean crushing plants that are being developed in Iowa and the Dakotas. Uh, they're being developed, as Ron indicated, for the oil market because we have seen soybean oil go from 30 cents a pound to 80 cents a pound. In fact, the ethanol industry isn't enjoying that benefit as well on the corn oil we remove. Um, but Phillips Petroleum, Chevron, they are all locking up the takeoff on these new plants. They're investing in these new plants that are being built and they're ta doing takeoff agreements on the soybean oil that will come from those plants. So the, uh, the oil industry has been very active uh, in the renewable diesel market and continuing to look for ways to move beyond <clears throat> pure petroleum plays. And I think that goes to their corporate boardrooms as, as you had discussed. So they are trying to move and stay with the political carbon situation in this world. Yes, and go ahead, Representative Swanson. I was just gonna add to it is um, this year there seems to be a, a good, good movement afoot to go to a 20% um, soy oil. Um, I believe the bill has passed through the Senate. Um, we've tried for many years to get this bill passed and have not been successful, but it seems that uh, there is movement afoot in the Illinois uh, General Assembly to, to be more supportive. And as we see the price of fuels increase and we can homegrown our own energies, what a great opportunity for us to, uh, to increase from the 10% to 20% um, biodegradable soy fuel. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think the, the legislation's there and I think it's got a great chance of, of making it through the General Assembly this year.